Well, hello, my name is John Meyer, and welcome back to another episode in my series on making music for licensing with an emphasis on production music libraries. This week, I'm joined by my friend and fellow contributor to the Merge catalog, Peter Mowry. Before we jump into the conversation with Peter, I want to tell you about next week's episode. I have some free samples for you. It's been a while since I've given some away, and I know many of you found this channel because of free samples. And on the surface, they may not seem like the most interesting samples, but next week I'll show you why I made them for myself and why I think they could be of value to you. So please subscribe, turn on notifications so that you'll know as, as soon as the video is ready. So now for this week's episode, a discussion with my friend Peter Mowry about the production music process, about being curious about different types of sounds, balancing our artistic endeavors with our production music projects. Uh, he goes over some of the equipment that he uses in his studio, and then we spend some time breaking down a track that he wrote for this album. Enjoy. Different time zones. We have never met in person. This is the, the most that we have communicated is through these computer screens and telephone, but I met Peter. We both composed for a different library years ago, and I was really drawn to his music. And then when I got the opportunity to expand Merge and to start adding um, more composers, it was a pretty obvious choice to reach out to Peter, and he uh, got right back to me. And it's been about a year and a half or two years, something along those lines, a handful of quarters. That's the way my life is in, yeah. in four quarters per year. And so he's contributed quite a few tracks. Peter, why don't you tell me a little bit about what you've got going on musically and, and how you got into production music? It's kind of a funny journey to think back on. I'm sure you can relate. Like my earliest musical kind of experience was picking up a guitar at age 13. And I was just always drawn to making music. And the guitar was the instrument that really spoke to me the most. And uh, I was self-taught with that and by about age 17 or 18 that's when I decided I wanted to maybe learn a little bit more about what I had taught myself so I ended up going to Berkeley School of Music in Boston and uh, studying there for a little bit and um, after that I found that I really started getting interested in recording. Uh, when I was a freshman at Michigan State I, I bought a tiny little four-track digital recorder I don't even remember the, the brand that it was, but I didn't have any software for my computer or anything yet. But I just, I knew I wanted to do some multi-track recording. I knew I wanted to do work like that. So I used to sit and just plug my guitar into that and just do layers and layers of guitar while my, you know, in the dorm room, my roommate would be asleep. It'd be like midnight. I'd just be doing that. Um, so I was always really drawn to the recording side of things, but it was never like a big part of my plan or like a big... Thing I really saw myself doing um, but as I continued to play professionally and kind of continue to find what I wanted to do I started to just be more drawn to the recording world um, when I lived out in Los Angeles I had friends who used logic and that was my first it was probably about 12 years ago that I saw that and that was my first look into um, professional you know DAW type of, of work and um, from there, I started really recording things the same way I learned to play the guitar. I started to just kind of teach myself, well, this sounds good. Um, I'll do this. I'll try this. You know, you kind of experiment at those early uh, stages. And uh, then I got into production music, which was about um, eight or nine years ago. Um, I started really liking the idea of writing music um, for television, for radio, for specific scenes on a specific type of show. Um, and I, I started writing and I started really trying to get my ear to a place of, you know, taking it to the next level. And, um, yeah, it's been about eight years doing that. And, uh, it's just been fun to continue working. And like you said, we kind of hooked up about a year and a half ago and it's been a really great relationship. I love writing with you. I love working for Atomica. I feel like Merge is such a cool, uh, label. You know, I think there's a lot of really neat sounds that we're doing that I haven't done before. Tell me about some of the projects that you worked on, bands you played with. I know you spent some time on a cruise ship. Yeah, um, I've done a couple of different types of musical performance. And I spent a lot of time in, in studios as well, but uh, not on the recording side or the engineer side, but just recording albums with different bands and different uh, musical 
entities. Um, yeah, so in LA, I uh, was out there playing with Lord Huron. Uh, that's the band uh, I was the original guitarist for. So um, I didn't do anything uh, on the recording side with them, but I did the initial tour with them. So we, we toured around the country and got in the big white van and did that thing. And I realized pretty quickly that I didn't really want to do that. <laughs> um, but I, I with uh, an, another musical entity that I've been with is uh, Western and Maori is a musical duo that uh, I met Brian Westren, who's an amazing songwriter. I met him at Michigan State University and we hooked up and just kind of hit it off right away and we ended up recording. I think we've done about four albums now, a lot of different singles. Um, and that's been about 15 years we've been doing that. You obviously have a curiosity for lots of different styles and different sounds. And if you want to sustain in this business, you've got to be able to do a lot of different things. And that's what I really noticed right off the bat is that I heard some acoustic stuff, but then I heard some of your guitar work. And then, you know, I asked you to, about contributing on some other projects and you jumped right in and you understand how to learn new types of sounds. And I think that is a skill that uh, all production music composers have to have and, me and media composers of any kind. You've got to be able to figure out what it is you need to do. And if you're like me, that process, you realize that music is music and the sounds change in the way that you create the sounds. But there's so many YouTube videos and YouTube channels just like this that can tell you how to get those sounds. Oh, but it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's being able to listen and understand and break music down. And you really have a knack for that. Real quick, tell me about, or take your time, but tell me about this uh, piano-based cinematic thing you put out recently. Yeah, so the point you made about curiosity, I think that's really the, the most important thing, at least for me, is exploring whatever I'm curious about and being able to just dive into something that is new and is the unknown, uh, but feel confident in, in, in thinking to myself, I can figure this out. I can figure out how to do this. Um, so about a year and a half, two years ago, I started really getting into uh, orchestration. I just fell in love with some of the classic uh, film scores, um, you know, the John Williams, the Michael Giacchino, Thomas Newman. I just, I would listen to them and just be amazed at the thought that was put into all of these different parts and the emotion that you can get from just combining these sounds and these notes. And so around that time, I started really getting into piano-based composing as opposed to guitar, which had been the majority of my life. So, um, yeah, so I just recently started a, a independent uh, project um, outside of any band or outside of music licensing, just releasing myself of uh, piano, mostly piano based music. Um, in a way, it's kind of it's I talked about the journey of like how you how I've made it through the musical world and kind of ended up doing production music. It's kind of the same thing with this independent release. I feel like it's, I'm just kind of jumping into this whole new area and just seeing how it feels and, and, and hearing beautiful piano work from hundreds of years ago to modern composers and just kind of falling in love all over again with a different style of music and thinking to myself, hey, why, why don't I try to try my hand at this? And also it, the last album I released called Portal, it came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, I wanted to create something that you could just put on and it could just sit in the background of your life for whatever you were doing. If you're having a cup of coffee, um, taking a walk in the woods, um, some quiet moment that you could just let the music kind of sit there, but not overpower you, but also maybe help you maybe kind of get to a place of more calm and, and even meditative type of, of headspace. Um, which I think is probably especially important right now for all of us to take that time to step back and, you know, take a, take a load off here and there. I went through a similar process about a year ago when I decided to do my own, you know, paper trail album mm -hmm. and, uh, just, just to kind of go after some things that were non-production music related to sc scratch the itch of, uh, some sounds that I wanted to go for, but also I found it's just a completely different way of thinking about music. When you sit down to write a production music piece as opposed to a Peter Mowry piece, are there differences in your brain in the way that you approach that? Or does it somewhat feel the same? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I, it's a really good question because I think in some ways it's yes and no. You know, I think because the music is coming from me, of course, 
I would think all of my music probably has some signature to it that feels like my sound or my style. I think the beauty of, of production music is most of the time there's an assignment in place. There's some type of goal that we're trying to accomplish. Um, I remember I, I watched an interview of Alan Menken, who was a, a great composer of a lot of Disney films. And uh, the interviewer was asking him about Aladdin, A Whole New World. They were like, how did you come to that? What happened? And he was like, oh, it was pretty quick. It was about 20 minutes. And they were like, you wrote that in 20 minutes? And then he answered, he said, well, once the assignment was clear, what this particular scene was supposed to do, yeah, it would just, it unlocked and I could do it. So that's, that's one of the things I love about production music is, yeah, we sit down and we talk about what's the goal here? What are we trying to, to do emotionally? And let's do it. Let's, let's create sounds that will work in that situation uh, where the independent release that I do, uh, it certainly, I come at it in a similar way of, wanting the song or the album to have a certain vibe to it. But I think I maybe get a little more exploratory, um, maybe do some things that, you know, it, the, there aren't as many rules, I would think, in the independent releases because you can, I can have a 12 minute song if I want to, I mean, and just let things go, kind of go in a different direction if I feel like that's where I want to take it. I'm 10 times the artist that I was because of production music you know the training that you get trying to write all these different styles and sounds it's invaluable i mean what you learn most likely when you get tasked with an assignment you buy some equipment that will work yes. with that assignment and you learn how to do that and then you can take the parts of it that you really enjoyed for the production stuff and put it in your uh, artist projects and so to me i have to have both i have to keep them separate but they they're they're intertwined and that's confusing but uh i just see them as they have to be something that i have in my life all the time uh, yes. production music is a job that i love going to whereas the recreational activity is trying to write something or in this case make youtube videos you know i, I just need something that kind of challenges me in a completely different way to come up with something that that wasn't there and know that when people hear it it's got my name on it so there's that added pressure Whereas sometimes you can write a ridiculous production music piece that's meant to be ridiculous, you know, because it's for some very, very niche thing. And it doesn't necessarily have to be associated with me directly. I can kind of hide behind it. And <laughs> I have plenty of production music pieces that I'm very proud of and I'll play for anybody. But there are some that, you know, you wrote for something very, very, very specific. And right. it just wouldn't sound right on an album, you know, on Spotify. 100%. I see some gear behind you, and we don't have to get crazy in depth, but is there anything that you want to show us? Is there any piece of gear that you're proud of or has a story behind it? Here's a piece of gear I'm very proud of. Oh, hey. Here's my, my six-year-old. What's up, sweetie? Wait. I can look right out my window and see a Thomas the Train track, and, <laughs> and so at any moment I'll get in a visitor. That's just... <laughs> the times we're in. But this is our life normally, so it's not that much different for the uh, fact that we are in quarantine. I would say this is probably my favorite instrument right here. This is like the first big purchase I made. Uh, I was about, I guess, 21 when I bought this. It's a Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, Fender Stratocaster. Uh, he's my all-time favorite guitarist. My whole thing for about 10 years of my life was trying to sound exactly like him at live shows. Uh, Actually, what's funny is I don't use this guitar on production music very much. It has a very specific bluesy rock sound, as you can imagine, and I haven't written a lot of music like that for production music, so it tends to be more for my independent releases. My wife Andrea got me this Fender Telecaster uh, for our anniversary a couple years ago, and this is this I use a lot on production music. Um, I was never really a Telecaster guy. I know like. I don't know if you can relate to this, but in my youth, it was almost like you choose your guitar and that's what defines you. You know, you're a Les Paul guy mm -hmm. or you're a Fender Strat yeah, yeah. guy. I was like, and for some reason, the Telecaster never, I was never drawn to it. But um, the older I got, the more I was interested about it. And it's just so versatile. You can, you can do so many sounds with this. So yeah. I use this a ton. Other than those guitars, I have a couple of keyboards i have a yamaha uh, motif xs6 it's like almost a full scale 
keyboard, so it's good for the live performance, kind of as close as you can get to that sound. I've got this little complete control keyboard right underneath the monitor. I find it's nice to have a small keyboard just to get some of those simple ideas out. Mm -hmm. um, the, the not really performance moments, but like just a little simple quick thing as I'm messing around. At this point of the interview, I thought we were coming to an end, so I was gonna try to end it, and you can hear me make an idiot of myself. But it led to Peter uh, delivering a pretty profound statement on working alone as production music composers. All right, Peter, man, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, show us around your place and to talk about your music. Um, we'll be sure to let everybody know which tracks you wrote. Uh, this is stupid, this is stupid. Oh, now you get to see my process. This is my process of me this is, talking to myself. This is one of like the things I was gonna say too about the beauty of writing production music is it's just you in a, in a room alone for the most part. And you can just go through all the stuff that you want to go through. Like even like guitar take after guitar take and no one's having to push the record button. It's just you. <laughs> it's the That's best. a great point in that I think that I, for lack of a better word, flourished when I wasn't. I love working with people and I always want to work with people as much as I possibly can. But I would compare myself to people so much or I would think that they were better than me and I would always... You know, sometimes I'd fight for an idea, but I'd always be deferring. And then you get in the point with production music where you're like, if I want these drums to sound this way or guitar to sound this way, I've got to do it. Mm -hmm. And that forces you to get better. So it's about finding that balance between collaboration, but also you've got to trust yourself because the, the way the business works, unfortunately, if you can't make, it, make a go on a, a significant amount of material on your own, you're going to struggle. You know, it's, yes. it's about... It's about quality and quantity is what it was told to me from the very beginning. And that's, that's very true. You got to make a lot of it and it's got to be good. So. Well, it's the point you made before too, about, about looking at production music as kind of like going to your job. I would hundred percent agree with that because you do, you have to go some days. I'll write a song front to, to finish in like two hours and I'm done. And I'm like, this is perfect. Other days it's like two weeks and I'm like, what is happening here? Why am I not getting the sounds I want? But you just keep going. It's like you just show up. You just keep showing up and doing it. I absolutely agree with that. There's so many albums. There's so much stuff. You can't dwell on it. You know, you like I have to meet deadlines, and those deadlines keep me motivated. And because if I didn't have those, I would drag this out forever. And so oh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, I need. That's another way. Like you said, it's, this is my job. I want to be as creative as I possibly can in this job, but I've got people that rely on me and yeah. you know you need me to get albums done and, and you need to get albums on the site and other writers everybody needs to keep the keep the train moving so what I'd like to do is talk about one of the tracks that you've made because you've heard some of the tracks on the album so were you trying to fill a void that wasn't there were you just trying to go by the brief you just explain kind of what you were thinking about when you were writing it. one of my biggest weaknesses with writing production music is a lot of the time I have trouble steering the song back to where it needs to be. Like sometimes it just starts going in a direction and I'm like, I gotta go this way with it, I have to. And then I'm like, wait, is this gonna fit? Is this gonna work? And this is one of those tracks I sent to you and luckily you were like, yes, I love it. This is gonna work great. Um, so that, that felt great to get that feedback because this one, I viewed it as being a little bit more on the serious side for this mm -hmm. album. Um, you know, we talked about having songs that maybe had a little bit of shades of positivity that kind of give a hopeful feeling. And I think you could find that in this track, but I think for the most part, this has kind of a getting to work seriousness to it. Um, not sad or too serious, but there's definitely a, what I pictured while writing it was um, people working on something and just upping the ante. Let's get this thing done. Let's, let's figure out the solution for this comment on what you said I think that was an excellent yeah. point that's why I do the description and all that as kind of a center that we can kind of draw back to as we're writing when there's a center there's always like a left and a right there's always some parameters that you can kind of on this one go a little serious or go a little positive this way but I'm the same way and that there's a point where you try to keep it close but if it needs to go another direction you just kind of let it go that direction you make the best track possible and most of the time you've done enough to make it fit with the concept of the album and sometimes the album shifts like sometimes it changes what it's going to be and 
We're not going to call it something that it's not when it's done. But what you want more than anything are good, compelling tracks. Mm -hmm. And you want them to fit, but also know that people search by album and by description and by cover art and all that stuff. But they're also finding things by the metadata and searching for individual tracks. And whereas the case 20 years ago when someone got a CD or 30 years ago or 40 when it was a vinyl, it had to be through the album. But now there's lots of different ways. So, um, yes, we want to stay as as focused as we can. That helps us put the box around it, you know, like we talked about earlier. And it helps us stay in that mindset and it and, and helps us stay focused. But the track needs to be the best it can be. Here's Peter's track played in its entirety. Show me some of the tracks, some of the sounds you used, and uh, you know we're also trying to incorporate Piano Book as much as possible. The sounds from the website pianobook.co.uk. I I've submitted some sounds there, and I've, I'm using them on some of my projects. So yeah, just kind of tell me some of the highlights of uh, some sounds that you you really uh, enjoyed working with. All right, let's take a look at my track "Increasing Our Effort." So as you can see, we have. Uh, all of the piano book samples here in orange at the top. Uh, so the very first track I, I started recording was the Kawhi Felt Piano. So um, let's hear that by itself. I like the idea of just doing the mid to low notes with this one, just to be able to control some of those frequencies. Logic EQ, and I also use the Pro Q by Fat Filter. And then uh, with that, I use the Woodchester sample down here. So you can hear how those two sound together. And on the Woodchester, just another little bit of EQ, give me more control to be able to separate those two out. Um, so let's go and move down the line here. So I have the, the shimmering guitars, uh, I have them come in right after the, kind of the midway section. This is a really nice sound. Uh, I tweaked them a little bit with some EQ and with the double lock uh, from uh, Sound Toys, and uh, we get this kind of sound. Let's hear that by itself. Kind of hear 
that sounds in the track. And uh, here, this next one, I think I misspelled the track name, but it's the uh, Studio Lucid uh, Pizzicato Cello. Really nice for those lower to mid frequencies. I put the decapitator plug in on it as well, um, just to kind of warm it up a little bit. I tweaked some of the, um, the highs on it as well, so I turned that tone and the high a little bit down. Um, and then after that, we have the soft drums coming in, and this is just a, uh, a snare. I think that the snare sound is the only percussive sound in this whole song. So we can hear that coming right here. And here I got some reverb on there. Again, I use the decapitator on this as well, uh, just to, um, actually it doesn't look like I did much tweaking with that, uh, just to give it a little bit of that natural distortion. I wanted that snare to sit a little bit further back than I would usually do, just to kind of give it a little extra movement when it came in. Here are two really wonderful samples, the flute, violin, waves, and uh, the sustain. So these, the first one here is uh, just a little bit of EQ. bring in the uh, sustain and I tweak this a little bit more with the tremolator and echo boy just to give it a little bit of uh, movement to make them work together we get atmospheric really great sound you can hear how it sounds together coming in at the beginning you know, just really I feel like it, it set the song up in a really nice way right at the top. Um, I had the kalimba piano coming in at about the halfway point to do some uh, some lead lines, so we can hear how that sounds. Basic backdrops, which is a great pad sound. Um, I found all of the pad sound really nice. This one in particular, a little tremolo in there. So we already heard the Woodchester piano. Let me jump down here before we get to some of these final sounds. Um, I love this sound, the uh, Oliver Arnold's. Um, the felt grand piano. I love tweaking this to give it um, a more atmospheric sound. I find it works really well to just almost set up some lead lines that come in later so you can kind of hear how this sounds here. And I had that come in with the Stratus piano and Stratus synth all at the same time. there to be a little bit of a synthy sound in this. So the song has a slow build. It just continues to introduce new elements into it. We can hear when the soft drums come in here and uh, The three parts I played live, the bass and uh, just a couple acoustic, kind of ticky little, almost percussive sounding. And then finally at the end I wanted to bring in a couple of elements just to bring the song home. So this is... Uh, Chamber Waves by uh, Oliver Arnolds. It's really nice. And then 
finally we have the Hans cellos, of course, and another uh, chamber waves here. Uh, now we have the, the Hans cellos and the chamber waves coming in at the very end. And then finally at the end we have uh, the Hans Zimmer cellos and another chamber waves coming here. You can hear a little sound. Just to give a little bit of a, a build, a little bit of a lift to that final hit at the end. All right, and uh, that is everything I did for this track. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks again for following along in this process. Next week we have more. We'll have more for you, <laughs> including some some free sounds and all that. It's quarantine. This is what we deal with. But if you haven't subscribed, do so. I would appreciate it. Sign up for the notifications. Whatever you got to do, and we'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>